Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Jay Franzi about leadership in career development in the music and securities industries. Jay Franzi, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have this conversation with you today. We've been preparing for this episode for a while, and uh, you have an interesting background. I'll get into that a little bit more here in a moment when I read your bio, but you, you've been a leader in the security industry, in the music industry, and so we're going to focus our conversation today on leadership and career development uh, generally, but also specifically within those industries and your experience in relation to those. As we get started today, I just wanted to share Jay's bio with everybody. Born and raised in a suburb of Boston, Jay spent his early years building his passion for leadership development with a focus on the entertainment industry. After graduating from college, Jay moved to Nashville to work in the music in Music City, building a name for himself during his 25 plus years as a leader in the industry. Jay is an author, speaker, coach uh, with a passion for leadership development. His coaching focuses on branding and development, leading people and teams to reach their maximum potential through strategic coaching. Jay is an advisory council member for Harvard Business Review, an advisory board member at Rutgers University, and a 2020-2021 inductee uh, of Marquis Who's Who in America. He is also the host of Franzi and Friends, where leaders share their secrets. Jay is the vice president of the Northern California market and the vice president of strategic account operations at G4S Secure Solutions, specializing in integrated security solutions that mitigate risk and add value. Their suite of products and services include risk consulting, software and technology, systems integration, and security officers. Jay has written three books and countless articles. His latest book, Leadership, Lessons from the Field, is a collection of blog posts that turn managers into leaders through lessons Jay has learned from his time spent in the field. Jay currently lives outside of San Francisco with his lovely wife, Jennifer, his two beautiful daughters, Bella and Lucy, and their two dogs, Charlie and Zoe. Uh, what a wonderful background, uh, and I, I'm particular to both um, the children and the dogs. I have six children myself, and I have two dogs, and uh, they are uh, such a joy. Um, Jay, welcome to the podcast. Anything else you would like to share by way of background or personal context before we really dive on in? You know what? That what you read is going to be hard enough to live up to. So, <laughs> and as far as the kids and the dogs go, you just let me know your address, and I'll ship them to you. <laughs> yeah, they're they're a lot of work, but uh, but a lot of fun as well. Well, great. I thought as we really get started, uh, perhaps you could lay a little bit of the groundwork for the conversation by sharing with us a little bit about your twenty five plus years in the music industry. Um, that again is kind of unique. I, I, I'm trying to remember, I've interviewed, you know, a couple hundred people for the podcast. And I, I don't think I've interviewed anyone previously uh, that had, you know, leadership roles in the music industry. So tell us about how that happened, how you got into that. And, and then we can go from there. Sure. No, it's definitely a unique path, right? Um, so I, I started young. It was probably just like anybody else in high school that I wanted to a way to make the girls interested. So I was playing in bands and working um, as a musician, playing in the local clubs and things like that. I really enjoyed it. I really liked music, but I wasn't good at it. So what I did was I, I became the person who was technically um, inclined. So I was running the gear and I was 
um, setting up for the shows and re- recording and doing everything I could like that. And I really liked it. So I wanted to pursue that. But when I told my parents I wanted to pursue that, my father looked at me and said, you know what, we'll support that, but you have to have a backup plan. Because at the time, there wasn't even um, audio schools or things like that you could go to at the time. So I did. I went to business school, and I'm glad I did. And then after that, they shipped me off to Ohio where there was this first sign of a school, and they were putting together a program. So I went through their program. And when I came back, I mean, I came back, you know, high and mighty. I was all good and ready to go thinking, okay, I had this piece of paper from the school that says I'm a certified audio engineer. So I went around to all the, all two of the studios that were in my neighborhood. And they said, yeah, okay, great. We'll hire you as, as a freelance engineer. And I thought to myself, I didn't know what freelance meant at the time. So I thought, this is awesome. I just went to school. I got out. I have a job. See that? It all worked out. But it, you know, as we all know now, that freelance is not what what you would think. So after years of cutting my teeth and you know learning what to do and so forth, I worked during the daylight hours at one studio, and we were recording books on tape. It was very exciting, but we were recording books on tape, and then literally that same day, I would walk across the street to the other studio at night, and we would record rock bands. So I really enjoyed it, really liked it, and then I eventually moved to New York and continued doing it, opened up my own facility and really enjoyed it, but I wanted to take it to the next level, and one day I was sitting around my dining room table, and I was holding a Shania Twain CD in my hand. I'll I'll never forget that moment. I was holding this Shania Twain CD, and I was looking at the credits, and there was this, the engineer on the credits was Bob Bullock, and I said, okay, Bob Bullock is in Nashville. So I said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and move to Nashville. I'm going to go teach at the college, and I'm going to go work with Bob Bullock. So I hopped in my car, and I drove. I was literally gone for maybe that next day. And I left my house, and it's you know it sat there for about a year before I finally sold it. But I moved to Nashville and got an apartment, and just I went to that school, and they looked at me like I was nuts. And they said, you know, that's not the way this works. And again, I had to fight the challenges but the one thing that I got lucky about the one of the teachers that I studied under in Ohio was now teaching at this college so he kind of helped me and showed me how I could get into the school and how I could become a teacher so I did that and it took it took about a year's worth of time but I did it and then eventually he he retired he was the director of education and he retired and I took over his spot so I worked my way into the director role and it was my my job for the students to bring in people from the industry so they could demonstrate their skills. One of the people that came in was Bob Bullock. And I said, okay, great. So I asked the students, you know, who wants to help set up the studio? And nobody wanted to help. I don't know if they had a project going on or something that kept them from wanting to help, but nobody wanted to help. So I went in and I set up the studio on my own. And Bob came in and taught to the, the students and then at the end of the session, when all the students left and Bob was cleaning up his, his belongings and getting ready to leave, I walked him out and I was standing in the lobby of the school and he looked at me and he said, who set up the studio today? And I said, well, I did. And he goes, wow, he goes, that's exactly the way I like things set up. He goes, would you ever consider coming to work for me? I mean, it happened those exact words just like that. And I said, absolutely. So... At that moment, I went and worked for Bob, and I did that for about three years. And that was my connection to what I consider the real entertainment industry, where I was working on records that you would find in stores and hear on the radio and that type of stuff. So that was my my entryway. Well, that's super interesting, and I applaud you for following your, your interests and passions even down an uncertain path. Uh, you have more guts than I think a lot of people <laughs> who who get nervous about those sorts of things. I think a lot of people end up going the safe route, you know, and uh, uh, I mean, even as your parents said, you know, have a backup plan. That's not a bad idea. Don't get me wrong. Um, and I teach in a business school, so there's nothing wrong with, you know, getting a business degree as a backup plan. Um, but I, I do think there's a lot of people that uh, are a little bit too nervous um, about, you know, following their, their, 
interests, their dreams, their passions. And so uh, great work there and, and the grit and the determination and, and just the persistence to make it happen. Um, you know, most things don't come easy in life. And, and if we want to achieve things, you know, we, it's not enough just to, you know, go to school and get that degree. Or, you know, like you said, you got that certificate, you're ready to go. You've proven yourself. Well, it's not that simple. You know, you have to go out and actually prove yourself in industry. And, and I think that applies to music industry, to business, to whatever, you know, walk of life that we're, we're talking about. Well, very good. So at, at some point you, you make a transition 25 years plus in the music industry, what caused you to make that transition? Oh, great. That's a, a good question. And let me go into it. But before I do, let me just point out, you said it's the grit and everything that goes into hanging in there. And there's two things I'd like to tag onto that. One, I was probably, as they say, young and dumb at the time, because I don't know if I would do that at, at this moment in life, right? Um, however, it was my passion and it was something I did. And that overnight success people talk about where I just had that lucky moment meeting this person in a, you know, in a school, that was... 15 years into it. So it was not something that just happened. It was 15 years of preparation for that moment. And I remember one of the other um, professionals that came in and spoke at the school, somebody asked him, you know, hey, how did you get your position? You've got, you know, you're one of the highest ranking people in town. And he said, well, it's not that I, you know, I'm better than anybody else. He goes, There's plenty of people out there who are better than I am. He goes, all that I did is last longer. So I just, you know, everyone went off, got married. Everybody wasn't able to live on the salary you could make and so forth. He says, I just last, outlasted them. So that's how I made it. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. That's where the grit and the, everything comes into it. But back to your question, how did it transition into the world of security? Um, it was about 11 years ago where the music industry start, started to take a real hard left turn, um, where you had all sorts of challenges with with people stealing digital music or the industry unfocused and not knowing where they're going or technology outpacing the industry where you can record at home and get just the good quality as you could in a recording studio. And in reality, the only things we were using the recording studios for at that time were recording live musicians. Like in Nashville, they still do that to this day where you get a group of eight guys in a room and they, they play all the musician, or I mean, all the parts in at one time. But then what happens nowadays is they take that hard drive with them and they go home and they record the rest of the parts at home. So the workload for somebody like myself was just cut in half. So you had to start being innovative and finding other ways of working the industry. So what I started to do where most guys started to go back on the road and started to work as a road musician, I started working more in artist development and putting um, career paths together for these wannabe artists and even the the more known artists, we book tours and get the tour buses going and started to make arrangements of how they can get around the country in a, in a more efficient manner to save money, to make the best use of their time. So I was doing that through transportation companies. So I spent a small stint working for a transportation company because I was when I was doing that, the company said, hey, you know, we like what you're doing. You're, it seems to be working out, and would you consider coming and doing it here? So I did, and we took a transportation company that was very small at the time. It was only like five or so vehicles, and we worked it up over a course of a couple of years to 150 vehicles, which included several tour buses and um, the mini coaches and so forth. And we would also have a series of SUVs and stuff that we would use to transport the artists to like the CMA awards and things like that. So I'm still working with all the people I worked with in the music business, recording their records, but now I'm making the arrangements for them to travel or go to award shows. And as I was doing that, I was also making the arrangements with their security teams, where to pick them up, how to you know, where we're going to drop them off, how we're going to handle the red carpet, you know, who's going to walk them down, what doors are we going to open. And that led me into a, a, you know, interest in the security side. So that's where I ended up. And that's when I got into more security. And I've been doing that for the past 10 years now. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, 
the alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Yeah, well, that's super interesting. And again, I applaud you for the flexibility and agility being able to pivot. Um, you, You highlight industry trends and shifts within the music industry, um, largely driven by technological advances. And I think outside of the music industry, across the world of work, we see that everywhere. Um, uh, it, It just looks perhaps a little bit differently, but I think disruption is the name of the game nowadays and new technologies are definitely, uh, shifting and disrupting the way we do our work, the way we interact with each other, um, the types of tasks that perhaps we previously performed. And, and now, you know, there's, there's programs or there's other software that can handle that for us or whatever the case may be in the music industry. Um, example, like you said, recording studios at home, uh, where, where people can do so much of that. And I've actually been quite fascinated. I, I, I am by no means, you know, even remotely knowledgeable about the music industry, but, you know, just watching some documentaries and some, some artists where they, you know, uh, show what they do in their home studios. It's, it's fascinating. Right. And, and the reality is that uh, it's a, it's a fairly low barrier to entry even um, to get the necessary equipment to be able to put together, you know, a really professionally sounding um, music. I think back, it was maybe 20, 2012, um, I, 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 I'll, I'll butcher it if I try to remember the names of the number two, the two top songs of that year, but both top songs, um, I think in 2012 were, were indie type, um, artists and, um, produce, uh, music produced outside of a major label or in a, in a studio. And I just remember being so fascinated by that. <laughs> like, wow, now, now anyone really could do it. Obviously there's a lot of work that goes into making that successful, but, um, but again, to the, to the point of your story, you know, the ability to innovate and be adaptive and, and agile within that disruptive space, I think is really an important lesson. And you were able to, to pivot into something um, you know, that was also needed and valuable, but perhaps a little bit different than what you've been doing before. And now you find yourself doing something completely different. The reality is, I think most of us find our careers to go in a nonlinear path, uh, or at least not a directly linear path we tend to have zigzags and it's just the way it is. I think very few people, you know, kind of set out at the be- beginning of their career, their young adulthood saying, this is what I'm going to do. And then they just do it for the next, you know, 40 plus years or in the workforce. And so uh, I think that's a great lesson. The other thing you brought up at, during that transition is your focus on, on career development of these artists. Uh, and I don't know how much of that had been happening before this transition period in the music industry, um, but that resonated with me as we were preparing for this episode, because I think career development and leadership development, it, generally speaking, just in the world of business, the world of work is such an important topic. And frankly, I think it's something that's often done quite poorly in, in many organizations. I'm not sure there's enough attention or priority given to developing people and, and helping them map out their careers and helping them have ownership over their own development, but also as leaders investing 
our time and energy as leaders into developing our people. Um, so maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what your approach has been uh, as you've done leadership um, uh, and, and career development coaching and consulting and uh, some of what you put into your books and those sorts of things. Sure. No, absolutely. I can tell you, even as, as early as this morning, I was in the middle of a conversation. We were discussing organizations and how organizations need to be more employee-centric. And when we talk about that, we talk about the employees and how, especially in today's world where there's so many different options for people that we have to keep people engaged. And if we truly, you know, the world of business is all about metrics. We got to reach the, you know, hit a certain amount of revenue. We got to, you know, in my world, it's, we got to maintain non-billable overtime and we got to take care of dark hours, which are hours that somebody requested service and doesn't, we don't provide it. So there's all sorts of metrics that people have to, to hit. But for me, it's more about the people. And that started when I was teaching at that college because I never went to school to be a teacher. I went to you know business school. I didn't think I was ever going to be a teacher. I was never certified to be a teacher. I can't even believe they, they let me teach. And at the time, I, did, I thought to myself, this is crazy. I don't know why they're allowing this to happen. But now I can understand, okay, 16 successful years working at that time um, in the music industry was credibility. But I didn't know that, and I didn't think about that. So in my mind, I was thinking, what can I do to prove myself to, that these, to my students, if nobody else, that I'm worth learning from? So at that time, I, I would study up on everything. I would study up on all the technology. I would make sure that if someone came to me and said, you know, how do you record this guitar? I wouldn't just say, well, I put a microphone in front of an amplifier and I hit the red button. I go into describing the frequencies and why this is set up the way it is and the mechanics between in the amplifier and, and show them there's more to it than just that. And during that time, I was taking that information and I was just making, I had like a two inch thick notebook, which I eventually turned into a book. And that book was what got the credibility of me um, teaching. And even when I went to work in studios in Nashville, I would see that book on bookshelves. So it, to me, I didn't think anything of it. To me, it was just a, my notes and a way of, you know, me earning my credibility, but I guess it earned credibility in a whole different way. So, but to the point of teaching, I never thought of being a teacher and I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed standing in front of the classroom and talking to people, but I really enjoyed the time in between the classes when the students would come up to me and ask me for personal advice and guidance and that type of stuff. So that was more important and more valuable, and I have countless stories of helping people and, you know, doing that type of thing. That was much more exciting than saying I was a teacher or that I stood in front of a classroom and got to hear myself speak for, you know, an hour or two or three. And then when I w had the opportunity to go work in the organizations that, I'm, that I work in now, they're much, much larger. I mean, the one organization you mentioned at the beginning of the show is the, the world's largest security company. It's the second largest employer in the world next to Walmart. So there's that many employees that work there. And in my world, I oversee about a thousand of them, you know, or thousands of them. And my team is a team of managers that are about eight people. And then they have a team that cascades below them and below them and so forth. And to me, what makes it most exciting and what's most interesting is coaching them and helping them through the things that nobody ever was able to help me through. Never had a formal mentor or anything like that. So I wished I did. And I learned from everybody I met, you know, I never, you know, never missed an opportunity to learn good or bad from somebody, but I never had that formal person. So I used to talk to the students and then now the employees, and I tell them the things that I wished somebody would have told me. It's really what it comes down to. You know, how can you make it? What, what are the right things to do? Or where are the right places in the organization to make friends or hang out or, or try to shadow somebody and what you can learn and now how you can apply that information to take the next advancement that comes along. So that's really how it started and how it works for me. Well, you, you said a whole lot there that I think is really important. Um, starting with your comment about the, the focus on people within organizations and employee engagement. Um, and I mean, if, if, if as leaders, if we, if our goal is to help 
the organization be as successful as possible, then we have to step back and ask ourselves, okay, well, how do we achieve that goal? And I suppose there's, you know, there's all these different functional areas within an organization and there's all these different forms of, of capital that an organization has as, at its disposal that it can prioritize and invest into, you know, to try to move things forward. You have the intellectual capital, you have the equipment, you have the property, you have all these different um, elements of capital. And it's, it's a little mind blowing to me that so often the human capital piece is for whatever reason, it ends up kind of low on the priority list, even though it's the people in that organization that are doing the, that are the creative individuals, driving the innovations, creating the products and services, and actually doing the work of the organization interfacing with the customer in order, you know, for the organization to bring value to the marketplace. And so if we don't invest in our people, then we're not going to attract and retain good people. The best people are going to leave and we are going to struggle to have a competitive advantage in the marketplace. So, I mean, you and I seem to be in sync there, you know, as we're talking about the, the value of people and, and, and engagement, and it, it does kind of blow my mind. And even, even though I've been at this for a really long time and I've talked to so many leaders, it blows my mind that there's still, even to this day, when there's so much evidence, you know, to support what we're talking about, um, the, the, the business case for investing in your people, even if you don't, if you don't buy into the, like what we might call the warm and fuzzies of, of HR or people development or leadership, even if it's strictly a selfish kind of self-interested business case for the success of the organization, we should be investing in our people to all the, you know, for all the reasons you just mentioned, um, it, and it's also where I find my greatest fulfillment as a leader. So one of the most important roles of a leader is to develop the people around them. And I have, if I'm in a leadership role, I have to be thinking about everyone on my team. How do I help them to maximize their potential? How do I prepare them to take over for me if and when I leave or take over for another person in the organization who may need to leave at, you know, at a higher level. And if we're not preparing people in that way, then we're shooting ourselves, our own future success and the success of the business. You know, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, And so perhaps, you know, it takes us, it requires us to take a step back and to just have those conversations uh, as leadership teams, as ex- executive teams on an ongoing basis to reaffirm our commitment to investing in our people and not just giving lip service to it. Um, because I think most leaders are going to say, yeah, it's important that we invest in our people, but going beyond the lip service and actually doing it right. And actually prioritizing it and in, in investing the time, the people, the, the money into the development of our people. No, you make some good points there. And I think it's important, like you mentioned, bench strength. That's that's the key for people to be able to move up so we so we can promote from within and we don't have to go to an outside source for our next group of candidates. And we're constantly building that team. But I think what it comes down to is leadership. If we can't make a solid business case for the leadership team, um, the stakeholders that are involved in, in allowing the decisions to happen, if we can't make a good business case for them, they're not going to push that down to to the lower levels. So if we can explain to them how turnover has a cost to it. So for every employee we have to onboard, we're looking at, say, $2,500. And if that person turns over within the first 90 days, what good is that? We're Now we're churning another person for $2,500 and then maybe another one and so on and so forth. So if we can make the business case and turn it into a metric that is easily – understood from somebody in a senior leadership role, then all of a sudden they might have some some stake in the game. They might say, okay, you know what, now you're making some sense. So how do we how do we come up with a solution after that? So that's employee engagement, like you just mentioned. If we keep our employees engaged, then we keep them on board and now we pass that 90 day mark. And now they're into the point where they're actually earning money for the company versus the company having to invest money into them. So say the first 90 days is all investment, and that's where we break even, the 90-day mark, and that's where we're going to recoup our investment. So from a business point of view, we have to be able to keep that person past 90 days. And every time or every day past that 90-day mark is 
obviously beneficial for the, the employee, but now it's also beneficial for the company. And if we can put that on paper or put that in a presentation and put that in front of our stakeholders, then we can come back and say, okay, now we're going to go ahead and invest some time and money into, like you mentioned, HR or the training and the things that we can do to hold engagement levels high for our employees. Because if we can keep the engagement high, that reduces the turnover, that keeps the excitement level going. And then it helps. It doesn't just help with the turnover numbers and the metrics. The key thing it helps with is building the team necessary to reach the metrics that you're trying to reach in the first place, whether that be revenue growth or reduction in overtime or any of the other key metrics that you're supposed to deliver on as a senior leader. This helps all of that. And then the last piece I'll mention on that, because I know it's a little long winded, is that our frontline employees are the ones we should be turning to for the new innovations because they're the ones that are doing the work. And if they're the ones doing the work and they, they encounter a problem, guess who's trying to fix that problem? They are. We're not sitting next to them. So if, if they're able, you know, if they're making 10 widgets an hour and they found a way to solve a problem with theirs and now they can make 15 an hour, they've just increased your product as well as, as, well as um, being more efficient in your business world of metrics. So I think it's important for us to focus on all of the variables and not just get so narrow minded in tunnel vision to focus on one thing. Because when we do focus on that one thing, we don't see a result right away. And then people say, well, see, I told you that didn't work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jay, this has really been a fascinating discussion. Uh, we are running a little bit short on time. Uh, but before we close, I want to make sure I give you a chance to share with listeners uh, how they can get connected with you, uh, find out more about your current work, uh, your your book, and anything else that you would like to share by way of last word on the topic for today. Sure, no, and I appreciate that. Um, my name is Jay Franzi. I'm on just about any social media um, platform out there. It's all at Jay Franzi, and you can find them all just by going to jfranzi.com. That's J-A-Y-F-R-A-N-Z-E.com. And if you do have any interest in things that I jot down on paper, you can read blog articles or find um, books or anything else you might like. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jay. It has been a real pleasure talking with you. And it's been fascinating to learn just a little bit more of the behind the scenes um, trajectory of your career in the music industry and moving into the securities industry. Uh, but I appreciate your passion for leadership and career development, uh, your passion around people development, uh, I think that's so vital to the successful organizations of the future, particularly in a world that is ever changing. And increasingly, it seems like that the, the rapid pace of disruption um, that continues to increase. And this year, uh, you know, this past year of COVID and just everything moving remotely is just, you know, one, one small example and as massive as it's been. It's just really one small example of all of the coming disruptions that I think are going to be in place. And we, if we're going to be prepared for it, we need to follow your example and others like you who lean into the change, are, are adaptable and willing to pivot, and, and to really focus on the people uh, around them and, and developing those people in order to get you through those changes. So thank you for those insights. Uh, I encourage uh, everyone to reach out to Jay. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.
Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.